Marriage is one of the most precious relationships that God has ordained, but many people seem confused about what marriage is. Creation and marriage, this week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Our topic this week is creation and marriage. That's right. What's it all about? Well, the Bible teaches that God's standard for marriage is a relationship between one man and one woman for life. That's where we get till death do us part for in right. marriage vows. Yep. Of course, uh, because of sin and death in the world, God has shown you know, what is allowable under certain circumstances that veer from this ideal. Now, we're going to be mentioning several Bible verses, uh, references today, so um, just due to time, we're not going to be able to read them all out. But if you'd like to get a pen and jot some of the, uh, the verses down uh, so you can study them later, that'd be good. Sure, yeah. Clear support that monogamy is God's ideal comes from Christ's teaching on marriage in Matthew 19, 3 to 6, for example. In this passage, he cited uh, the Genesis account, in particular Genesis 1, 27 and 2, 24, saying that the two will become one flesh. Uh, not more than two. Uh, another important biblical teaching is the parallel of the husband and the wife with Christ and the church in Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, for example, which makes sense only in, uh, with monogamy. Jesus will not have multiple brides. Right, and, and the 10th commandment, um, you shall not cover your neighbor's wife, singular. Uh, Exodus 20, 20, 17 also presupposes the idea that there's only one wife. And polygamy is expressly forbidden for church elders, for example. We see that right. in 1 Timothy 3, 2. And this is not just for elders because Paul also wrote, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 2. Paul goes right. on to explain that marital responsibilities in terms uh, that make sense only really with one husband and one wife. Right. Uh, for example, uh, the godly people, uh, the example of godly people is also important. I, Isaac, uh, Isaac and Rebecca were monogamous. They are often used as a model in Jewish weddings today. Uh, mm -hmm. Other examples were Joseph and Asenath uh, and Moses and Zipporah. And the only survivors of the flood were four monogamous couples. Right. Uh, sometimes uh, critics will bring up examples of polygamy recorded in scripture uh, to try to right. justify having yep. multiple wives. But it's very important to remember that not everything recorded in the Bible is approved of in the Bible, right? <laughs> exactly. It just records what was going on. So yeah. consider uh, where polygamy originated first in the line of the murderer Cain, not the line of Seth. Um, the first recorded polygamist was the murderer Lamech. Uh, you can read that in Genesis 4, 23 and 24. Then Esau, who despised his birthright, also caused much grief to his parents by marrying two pagan wives. We read that in Genesis 26, 34. Right, and God also forbade the kings of Israel to have many wives. That's in Deuteronomy 17:17. 17, 17. Look at the trouble when Israel's kings disobeyed, including a deadly sibling rivalry between David's sons from his different wives in, in, in 2 Samuel 13. You can read about that also, 1 Kings chapter 2. And Solomon's hundreds of wives helped lead Solomon into idolatry, ultimately in 1 Kings 11. Yeah. Now, skeptics try to discredit this teaching by pointing to examples of multiple wives in the, um, in the Bible had by godly men. Okay. But uh, yeah. actually, yeah. what does the Bible actually teach? That's what we need to, need to see. Right. Yeah. Abraham and Sarah would have been monogamous apart from a low point in their faith, <laughs> you could call it that, when Hagar became a second wife. Uh, note how much strife this has caused mm -hmm. later with Ishmael and Isaac and their descendants to this day, right. as the Jews and the Arabs. Uh, Jacob wanted only Rachel, but was tricked into marrying her older sister Leah, and later he took their slave girls at the sister's urging due to the rivalry between the sisters. Right, and Jacob was hardly at a spiritual high, we should say, at, uh, at these times, and, and neither right. was David yeah. when, he, when he added Abigail and uh, Ahanam um, in 1 Samuel 25, 42 and 43. Also Hannah. 
Samuel's mother was humiliated by her husband, uh, Elkanah's uh, other wife, Penaniah, because of Hannah's um, previous uh, barrenness. We read that in 1 Samuel 1, 1 to 7. Right, yeah. So why did God seem to allow it then? Uh, God's permitting polygamy seems more like a case of divorce where God tolerated for a while under certain conditions because of the hardness of their hearts. Right. Uh, but it was not the way that it was intended from the beginning. As Matthew 19 verse 8 says, whenever the Mosaic law had provisions for polygam polygamy, it was always conditional. Uh, if he takes another wife to himself, it says in Exodus 20, uh, 21 verse 10, never an encouragement. That's right. God put a number of obligations on the husband towards the additional uh, wives, which would have di which would discourage polygamy. In view of the problems it caused, it's no wonder that polygamy was unknown amongst the Jews after the Babylonian exile, and that monogamy was the rule even amongst the Greeks and Romans by New Testament times. Yeah. And uh, we'll be back in just one moment. Many people think that Charles Darwin first thought of the idea of natural selection. However, others prior to Darwin described the concept, although they sometimes used slightly different terminology. For instance, Carl Linnaeus, the creationist father of taxonomy, wrote of a struggle for survival in nature. Similarly, James Hutton wrote about the concept of natural selection. Probably the most influential character was Edward Blythe, an English chemist and zoologist who wrote major articles on natural selection two decades before Darwin published On the Origin of Species. Darwin differed in trying to use the concept of natural selection to promote the idea of unlimited change. However, modern studies of natural selection have revealed that it is limited. It can only select between variations that already exist. It is incapable of producing the new genetic information required for true evolutionary change to occur, such as growing feathers on a reptile. Natural selection is not evolution. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. If you just tuned in, we're talking today about creation and marriage. That's our topic. Now, even though the Bible makes it clear that all people are descended from Adam and Eve, so they must be very closely related, there is uh, there's strong misconceptions about uh, among some Christians surrounding race. Surprisingly, perhaps, the, um, this can include concerns about the idea of marriage between two believers from different so-called races. Right, but these concerns have, have no basis in either science or the Bible. Uh, science has finally caught up with God's word in affirming how very closely related we're all, we all are genetically at the genetic level. Evolutionary thinking has historically dramatically increased racism. Right. Uh, Darwin believed that some groups were less evolved towards humanity than others. Uh, uh, and his own group was the most involved, uh, mo most evolved. Uh, now unsurprisingly, uh, Darwin's, Darwin's ally in Germany uh, was Ernst Haeckel, mm -hmm. and he even attacked the Bible uh, for its anti-racism. Right, and, and it's not as if we can solve all of society's problems with uh, race by simply decreeing on the basis of our, our close, close relatedness that there's no such thing as race. If right. that were so, then there would be just no such thing as racism, right? <laughs> or, or discrimination by race. But yeah. nor would there uh, even be the question of interracial marriage. In short, the, the word race still conveys everyday meaning amongst, uh, amongst people. We recognize right. that some of the more closely related uh, to us, and uh, hence, you know, kind of look more similar to, to us than others, of course. Uh, right, yeah, but what group differences exist are, tr are trivial. Mm -hmm. uh, modern discoveries in human biology and genetics confirm that things such as skin, hair, or eye color involve uh, no structures or functions unique to any group, just various amounts of the same stuff, basically. Mm -hmm. All people have the same skin pigment, melanin, a couple different types of it. Uh, there, there are those with more melanin, generally labeled black, but they're, they're really more dark brown, uh, and those with less, generally called white, are, are really light brown, actually a little, little pinkish because the skin is, is a little transparent and the lack of, of and, and, and that allows the, uh, the redness from the blood vessels to be seen. Right, and people with blue eyes have no unique uh, coloring uh, chemical. Right. It, it, yeah. It's that some, the same stuff, melanin, um, it's simply the way the light scatters from a, a lesser amount of melanin, just as uh, the sky's blue because of the, the scattering of the light from the air molecules, right? Uh, enhanced by fine dust particles. So similarly, these genetically programmed um, 
those genetically pro programmed to produce a lot of melanin in their hair will have brown or black hair, and those with a little bit have blonde hair, right? But it's still all the same stuff. Right, yeah. Incidentally, it's easy to explain how groups of people with different characteristics distributed variously across the world could have arisen very rapidly. The mm -hmm. Bible describes an event at Babel that provides the, the, the right conditions for the, it, it's the breakup of the population into a few dozen smaller ones that became isolated from each other. That's the key concept. Right. The world's population, having recently emerged from a, a near extinction event, the yeah. flood, <laughs> all spoke the same language. A small number of new uh, languages, which uh, form the roots of today's language family trees, was suddenly and supernaturally imposed upon this group at the Tower of Babel. Right. The resultant confusion and likely hostilities meant that each group rapidly fulfilled God's stated purpose for this event, namely to spread people over the earth and enjoy God's creation. In effect, the, the event imposed a virtual instant social and then geographic and then reproductive isolation from each other. Each group carried a different subset of the total gene pool. Right. And in chapter 18 of uh, Creation Ministries, uh, Creation Answers book. The answers book. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it explains in detail how this could have led to the sorts of genetic groupings, including the visible traits we see in human populations today. So, so racial differences, uh, though not the purpose of uh, uh, of this Babel event, were basically a side effect. A side effect, right? Yeah. Uh, desperate attempts have been made to use this and other portions of the Bible to justify the status quo in societies with slavery and or segregation. However, there's no suggestion in Scripture that God forbids either migration from one place to another or marriage between one ethnic group or another. Right, and we'll be back in just a little while. Creation Ministries International staff, many from a wide variety of scientific disciplines, have produced thousands of articles now available in a massive online database. Some of the topics covered include the feasibility of Noah's Ark and evidence for a global flood, scientific arguments that explain observations in astronomy within a young Earth time frame, recent discoveries that support dinosaurs fitting with biblical history, evidence from biology that shows that the type of change that is observed in living things has absolutely nothing to do with evolution. Got questions? Get answers at creation.com. On this week's episode, we're talking about creation and marriage. Creation. Now, even though there's only one race, uh, groups that have a longer history of isolation from each other, both geographically and linguistically, they've developed some, you know, greater differences between uh, the uh, other cultures, of sure, course. Sure, yeah. I interracial marriage will therefore often mean that one is marrying someone from a different culture. So there are wisdom issues here to consider. Right, and cultural differences can arise even when two people are of the same so-called race, right? Right. Uh, you know, a typical English person marrying a typical Russian, for example. Um, even these, uh, even those speaking the same language, such as Americans and Australians, are probably often uh, surprised at how great the cultural differences can be, um, sometimes even within the same culture, uh, yeah. country. Yeah, cultural differences can also greatly enrich both persons' lives, but they can also bring a unique set of challenges. Uh, couples wise enough to seek counseling on various matters prior to betrothal should consider such things as well. Uh, it helps to be able to anticipate the sorts of problems that might arise and bring the issues out in the open. Uh, the intention is to try to minimize problems should the marriage go ahead. Yeah, one of the issues in the way people see interracial marriage has to do with the misconceptions about the idea of a so-called pure race. Right? Right. Uh, yeah. Peter Sparrow, one of our uh, speakers in Australia, he once made a statement which probably startled a lot of people when he said, well, Adam and Eve were the ultimate mongrels. <laughs> oh dear, yeah, okay. Uh, now when you think about it, he's right. Yeah. The, the problem is that we've been conditioned to think that uh, genetically depleted populations uh, as, as pure mm -hmm. in, in, in the sense some are, are, are somehow better. Uh, in fact, it's the mongrel combinations in both animals and humans that have greater genetic richness, uh, more like the originals that God created directly. Yeah, a good illustration uh, uh, of this involves domestic dog breeds. Uh, starting from a, a Mongol dog population, breeders have been able to select out many different pure breed varieties as different uh, as, say, Great Danes from Chihuahuas, right? right yeah. But by isolating certain characteristics, breeders have had to ignore others. So by breeding for 
chihuahuaness, we'll say, uh, including, let's say, tininess, some of the genes for Great Daneness, right, such as the hugeness, okay. were yeah. lost in the process and vice versa. Right. right. So if all dogs in the world cease to exist apart from chihuahuas, one could never breed something like a Great Dane again. Right. To rebreed a Great Dane, you'd have to, you, you'd need the, the genetic richness and variety from that original mongrel population. Right, so the, the, the so-called pure breeds are in fact thinned out and genetically deleted, uh, depleted populations. They're, they're, they're more specialized, but also less able to vary and adapt further by selection. Right. Similarly, in human populations, Adam and Eve could not have been, uh, as they often been depicted as pale skinned, uh, you know, with blue eyes and blonde hair or, yeah. or whatever. And, uh, uh, or, or they couldn't have given rise to all of the different varieties of, of, of humans. They would likely have been middle of the road in, in most characteristics, thus providing for the uh, you know, a greater range of variety observed in their, their offspring. Right, in, in things like uh, skin shade and hair color, they were likely medium brown, middle brown. The descendants of people who have such rich genetic endowment can then express a great range of variation as these genes recombine. Their skin shading can range from, from white to black and every shade in between. And this is beautifully illustrated in the two-tone twins example, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, favored by CMI speakers. That uh, The two beautiful twin baby girls shown uh, were able to express that amazing level of variety in one generation because their mother and father, uh, pictured here, are themselves the product of so-called mixed marriages. In short, when two people from uh, different races intermarry, they gain a greater richness and variety in their genes, which is of course closer to the original. That's Adam right. Yep. Yep. How sad that so many, uh, often inspired by evolution and other radical evolutionists, have put so much fanatical passion into preserving their particular pure race. Yeah. Many have, have killed and even uh, willingly died for this cause. Uh, once you see it for what it is, it's your own genetically depleted race. <laughs> It doesn't sound like a cause worth wasting any breath on, let alone, let alone dying for. Exactly. When we start with the uh, real history of mankind, given in God's word, we can see there's no biblical or biological barriers to interracial marriage. In right. fact, there, yep. there are positive aspects to it. Uh, since the spouses in such a marriage are, are generally going to be uh, less closely related uh, than, the t than two of the same ethnic group, they're likely introducing greater genetic variety into their offspring, which is a healthy thing. And uh, we'll be back in just one moment. Did you know that the Earth's magnetic field has reversed direction or flipped multiple times in the past? The evidence for these reversals is rock solid because when molten rock cools, certain mineral grains align with the Earth's magnetic field, thus recording the direction of the Earth's magnetic field at the time in the solidified rock. Previously, most geologists thought that a single reversal would take many thousands of years. However, creation physicist Dr. Russell Humphreys reasoned they must have happened quickly to fit within the biblical time scale. So Dr. Humphreys made a prediction that quickly cooling thin lava flows would be found that recorded fast changes in the direction of the magnetic field. This prediction was later proven correct. Scientists were shocked to find major magnetic field changes had occurred within weeks in a single lava flow. They published this in the regular scientific literature. Thus, yet another scientific prediction based on biblical history proved to be correct. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Our subject today is creation and marriage, and we've been covering a lot of different aspects, but let's go further. Okay, let's look into another topic regarding marriage in the Bible. Currently in the US and many other countries, a so-called gay marriage is being promoted via the media and school systems. Uh, in the secular, politically correct world that we live in, the reporting of this issue is rarely balanced, and dissenting views are, are very often marginalized. Of course. Because legal acceptance of gay marriage is being celebrated as, as a victory for civil, li uh, civil liberties, it seems as if the media is really kind of out to shame any country, person, or group who doesn't toe the politically correct line here right. on this issue. Though, so this will be a, an increasing challenge to churches and Christians, of course, around the world. Yeah, CMI, Creation Ministries International, we have a booklet called Gay Marriage, Right or Wrong, and Who Decides? Mm, that's uh, the key. And in it, we documented the case of a Swedish pastor who was actually jailed for delivering an anti-gay sermon from his pulpit 
that that's in church, right in church. Yeah. And recently, the owners of a Colorado bakery faced a year in prison for refusing to make a cake for a homosexual couple who wanted to celebrate their recent marriage. Uh, a spokesperson for the ACLU who filed a complaint against the bakery said this, Religious freedom is a fundamental right in America, and it's something that we champion at the ACLU. We are all entitled to our religious beliefs, and we fight for that. But someone's personal religious beliefs don't justify breaking the law by discriminating against others in the public sphere. Yeah, wow. Yeah. These actions by the gay lobby are actually causing churches and individual Christians to retreat from engaging this issue for fear of uh, being, being branded and, and out of step with the culture, and, and we're still actually uh, actually having to break the law. Right. But, of course, there's double standards here <laughs> of course. at play, because it's seemingly only the Christian worldview, uh, the one that underpins most of the Western world societies, that is supposedly has to change here. In Toronto, Canada, uh, a lesbian woman went to a Muslim-owned uh, barbershop uh, because she wanted a man's haircut, makes sense. Uh, but under Sharia yeah. law, the Muslim men uh, who ran the shop are not allowed to touch a woman's hair other than that of their own immediate families. So okay. when the fam a lesbian complained, the Human Rights Commission intervened and demanded that the barbers uh, cut her hair, uh, even after the barbers offered to have uh, someone else cut her hair. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, makes you wonder why she didn't just go somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> Note, in this case, the Muslim's refusal wasn't based on her sexual preference, but just on the fact that she was a woman in, in a men's barbershop. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps this is why the case only went to mediation, whereas many Christian owners in the same position have been threatened with criminal prosecution mm. and possible jail terms. Uh, there, there are plenty of female-only or men-only establishments in all sorts of different service industries, so that the complaint is, is kind of ridiculous. Of course. Uh, this, this woman, like many in the gay lobby, wants to pick a fight and uh, force others to accept her lifestyle, but she refuses to accept anyone else's uh, religious preferences. Christians need to show uh, similar resolve to these uh, to these Muslims when it comes to right. uh, matters of, of offending, uh, you know, defending our faith. And as it was said in the Toronto Sun, uh, they've ordered bed and breakfasts owned by Christian families to take in gay couples. They've censored pastors and priests who have criticized gay marriage. Gays win because it's a test of who is most outraged and offended. But in the case of the Muslim barbers, the gay activists have met their match. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Yeah. And that's what we see yeah. time and time again is that, uh, you know, it, it seems like offending religious sensibilities only seems to, uh, you know, center around those of the Christian faith. Not in all cases, but the majority of cases, it's like, well, you know, everybody's got the religious rights, but you still have to toe the line on these, these social issues. But if someone gets outraged enough, and I guess Christians just don't tend to be as outraged as many other people. I guess not. <laughs> Amazing. Anyway. You know what? The Creation Answers book is a fantastic book. It's one of our most popular books. You can get this book at 30% off. It has answers to more than 60 of the most asked questions, including a chapter on different skin shades. 30% off. Just use the coupon code CMLCAB when you check out at creation.com. 30% off of that great book. Richard Van Grad and Kelvin Smith also host a fast-paced and informal internet-based video program called Genesis Unleashed. These faith-building teaching videos feature responses to news articles, summaries of articles on creation.com, interviews, and answers to some of the most asked questions about the creation evolution issue and the most attacked book of the Bible, Genesis. Visit creation.com's media center to view or subscribe to the latest video content. So our subject this week is creation and marriage, and we were talking about gay marriage, or so-called gay marriage. Yes, so how does this issue get linked to radical discrimination? Mm. That's a question. Uh, first, we need to recognize that the subtle language change, uh, there's been a subtle language change used to describe a person's sexual preference. Instead of being called a preference anymore, it's described as a person's sexual orientation. In short, supposedly, mm -hmm. uh, someone can uh, no more help being born a homosexual than they can choose their shade of skin at birth. That's the idea. Uh, the born that way argument is one of those uh, many myths used to defend gay marriage. Yeah, so the stereotypical arguments that are used are, uh, one, it, you know, it's unloving and discriminatory to oppose gay marriage. 
it's acceptable if they love each other, right, on the name of love. Right. Ten percent of the population is homosexual, and so this represents a significant portion of a population. Um, homosexual, uh, homosexuality is normal in the animal kingdom, as if that has anything to do with us. And, of course, the idea that homosexuality is a genetic predisposition. If you pick, you know, pick up our booklet on gay marriage or visit creation.com, you will see many art articles refuting these claims. But on the, yes. the last item, we would agree that you know people can feel a, a predisposition to act uh, as a homosexual, but sure. the, but there's no yeah. no evidence uh, for it, you know having a genetic basis like the gay gene, etc. Uh, we accept the fact that many people, including Christians and members of their family do actually struggle with these desires. And in many cases, they feel kind of powerless to control them. Right, but, but what if someone feels similarly emotion, a similar emotion or a most emotional desire to uh, steal or commit arson or even murder? Mm -hmm. and, and, and many do. Uh, the fact is that we all have a propensity to sin. Mm -hmm. We're all born that way. Mm -hmm. And so to do that is part of our nature. But this isn't recognized for what it is, because the real issue is that traditional Judeo-Christian values based upon God's word are being rejected in favor of a human-centered view of the world. Right. And see, if there's no creator God who made us, then humans are ultimately uh, free to embark upon any lifestyle they wish, as sure. long as it yeah. doesn't break any you know, laws, human laws. But if enough people uh, feel disposed to indulge in a certain lifestyle, then the laws can continually be changed to accommodate an ever increasingly sinful uh, behavior or, or lifestyle. After all, um, you know, we're not supposed to discriminate, right? Yeah, right. Uh, the tragedy in all of this is that because laws are being changed to appease such behavior along with increasing pressure on the church to conform, uh, it's becoming more difficult to help people struggling with addictive behaviors to receive help and the, the ultimate help, of course, is freedom from sin that comes through salvation in Christ. Right. Part of uh, recognizing that all humanity is, is fallen and needs help uh, goes back to those events in the Garden of Eden. Right. But, the, but yep. the book of Genesis is under attack like never before uh, due to this uh, one-sided teaching of evolution, of course, uh, practically in every country in the world is why we do what we do. Right. Yeah. A, a further tragedy is that increasing acceptance, uh, acceptance in the church of evolution or theistic evolution at the hands of supposedly Christian groups who teach such a low view of scripture and, and original sin it, that it's, it's barely recognizable as Christianity. Right. Christians shouldn't sit on the fence on this issue because gay marriage is, is not an issue Christians can really ignore here. It's going to be increasingly used as a club to beat Christians into submission and yep. silence. And uh, this is part of the Great Commission given to us. In, uh, you know, in your, honor, in your hearts, honor Christ as Lord, as holy, and be prepared to give an answer. Next week on Creation Magazine Live, we're going to be uh, doing Genesis 1 to 11, a case study for biblical authority. Next week.